Oops has a great advantage of being very inherently pliable. And we're taking that pliability to our advantage. What we're trying to do is curve it into the shape and the form that we want to create the loudspeaker cabinet. Now, if you take the grain orientation of the wood and you line it up together, obviously it's going to follow that same curvature and it's going to stay in that same shape. If you rotate that just through 90 degrees, just immediately, it becomes a great deal stiffer. Now, of course, that's not rocket science, that's plywood. That's how that works, right? But the reason we're doing this is because we want to bend it into shape, into form. Taking a regular sheet of ply and then bending it into shape or form is just not going to work. It's going to crack, it's going to fall apart. Now we do buy this in its flat sheet form and we do use it like this, but that's in the internal bracing system inside the loudspeaker. So the matrix assembly, which you'll all be familiar with, inside the speaker is made from pre-made, pre-bought, flat sheet, birch ply, which we buy like this. Very high quality. But that's the internal structures, it's straightforward. The cabinet form is beach and we're creating it ourselves. Each layer of wood is separated by this white sheet, which you can just see here. And that's a glue, essentially it's a resin impregnated contact sheet. And what happens is when you put heat into it, the glue activates. If you've been here before, you might recall in the old days, we used to use a wet glue roller. Essentially they feed each sheet through the roller and it would emerge impregnated with a glue. The reason we moved away from that is what happens is the glue would soak through the wood and into the outer layer of the finish, and you'd get a slight rippling effect. Moving to the dry glue gives us a much more, if you like, clean process. It's also better from a chemical point of view. The one downside of it is it requires significantly more heat. We used to press at around 90 degrees Celsius. We're now pressing at 135 to 140 degrees Celsius, which is a substantial amount of energy. But that's what's required, of course, to make that glue activate. So each layer is built up, layer of wood, layer of glue, layer of wood and so forth, to build different thicknesses. The smallest cabinets, like the 805, have 12 layers. So that's 12 structural layers of wood that you can see. What you will also get is an inner and an outer. The A face, of course, what you can see, the inner, is purely cosmetic. It basically actually is done mostly so if guys like you want to look inside the loudspeaker and take photographs, you get something that looks fairly clean as opposed to something that looks like wood. So this is just paper, nothing special. This, of course, is the A face. We'll come into this in just a minute. As you move up in size of the loudspeaker, the thicknesses increase. So for a comparison, this is an 801. That's an 805. And you can see a significant change. So an 801 is on 18 layers of wood, as opposed to 12 for an 805. Now the key point to understand is we have the same target for stiffness as every single model. There's no variation. It's not the case that we put more into the bigger ones because we can charge more. The reason the bigger ones require more is essentially there's more of it. So there's a greater propensity for it to bend and flex in unwanted ways. The smallest one is inherently very, very stiff right out of the box. So, would you mind, put your hand either side, I'll take that wood off your hands, try and give it a press as hard as you can. Yeah. And try and pull it apart for me. Okay. You get a sense of the strength of it as it is. As it is, of course, at the moment, it's just bent wood. But fundamentally, when you think about that, that's actually the structural process of something like a compound bow, you know, long bow. And of course, they have a huge amount of power inside it, and you can just feel that for yourself, how strong they already are. Clearly, what we want to do then is make them even more strong, or stiff, specifically. So what we're doing is putting internal bracing inside, but you can see all these machines, grooves and slots inside the structure. They're for that internal bracing system, that matrix system. So that black sheet ply is cut to form to create a bracing system of jig, if you like, that slides inside and is grooved and located into position and glued in place. Quick word on the cabinet form itself. You'll all remember this because you've seen it a long time. But nonetheless, it's just worth explaining. The idea behind this is to remove corners or joints, weak points of the construction. Standard box typically has four mitered wooden joints. Those mitered wooden joints are inherently the weak point. So the extreme curvature is about removing two of those four joints. The closed up spacing at the back, rather than the equal span, is about minimizing the distance from there to there, and therefore allowing us to use, again, the stiffest possible materials that we can. Then we've got to have a gap somewhere, because we've got to be able to get stuff inside it. 
but nonetheless the gap is as small as we can make it. Now if I've said that's the stiffest point of the structure, clearly we've then been idiots because we've cut a hole in it. But we have to cut holes in it because we've got to put driving yeah. somewhere, right? So, to bring that back, so would you mind, if you hold it just like that for me, what we do is use one of these aluminium plates. Every model's got one of those. They vary in size and form. And clearly what they do, sorry buddy, thank you very much, is they locate the side from there. Thank you, mate, I'll take a look at that. So they locate like that. So what you wind up with is that structure. You can't make this way anything. No problem. Now the size of the aluminium plate will vary in size depending on the size of the drive unit. Obviously, certain models only now have the front firing ports, so on most of them you won't get this lower section, it will only go around the drive units. Equally important point to emphasise though is we don't put it everywhere. There's no hole in the side of the cabinet. We only put it where we've created a weak point in the structure. That's why it's only here, not for example here, right? Now the bracing system's job, beyond bracing up the structure, is also essentially to compartmentalise the cabinet. If you wouldn't mind just holding that gently there, at the moment this is essentially like a tuning fork, and you can feel the vibrations moving down the structure, travelling down that unbroken length of the material. What we're going to do by putting this material inside it, is essentially break it up into smaller sections by damping it at key points this way, so that any energy that's in the system only has a certain length along which it can travel before we're controlling it and breaking it up. So the matrix isn't just about pushing against the structure, it's also about compartmentalizing the structure and turning it essentially into smaller sections for us to then damp the control. So put that together with an aluminium top, an aluminium inside, all the other bracing, what you wind up with is something that's a great deal more inert than a regular structure. Last part, on the outer face, You'll see a lot of cabinets like this, it doesn't automatically follow that they're going to be white. They might be painted finish. This is the essentially top surface that we put over the wood. Otherwise, of course, you've got something like that. So just to give us a nice, smooth, uniform finish, we're putting that on first. It's magazine front cover stock. It is about 130 gram GSM. That goes to the front, and that gives us that smooth surface, but this could then be painted any color. So it could be white, it could be black, could be a custom paint job depending on the customer. So portions will be like this. Of course you'll also see some that will be like this with a wood veneer. Now for the majority of the mainstream stock that we make, there you go, that's that paint job. We're using American walnut. The American walnut, obviously very high quality. Clearly if we supplied a pair of walnut loudspeakers to you like that, Technically that's correct, they're both walnut loudspeakers, you'd be quite disturbed about that. So our walnut veneers are what we call book matched. So as you go through it, you can see the grain orientations lining up perfectly. Of course the idea notionally of a book match is simply like that, straightforward. What that means is, the walnut loudspeakers are born as pairs, and they go around the whole factory together as pairs, and you can see them all the way around travelling together. It also means, should we be unfortunate, and we have a manufacturing incident and one of them gets damaged, they're both damaged because they're unique figuring, unique grain. In which case what we'll do is we'll sand back the veneer and we'll turn it into a painted cabinet. They won't go to the bin, they'll just be reworked. Different process with the painted cabinets, they can stay single cabinets all the way up to the final part of the production line. They only become pairs right at the very end of the process. Now there's a somewhat different manufacturing process to that for the signatures, but we'll go through that as we go through this afternoon. You'll also see it as we go around here, okay? Right. generation 801s. If you can't, there's one in reception when we go back to the visitor centre. They were what you would call more traditional wooden joint cabinetry. When we wanted to do this curved structure originally, we didn't have the ability to do it. So we contacted a company in Denmark, Ludwigsen. 
that specialised in producing curved furniture, and they had the necessary bent wood presses. So that's why these three machines, as you can see, were made in Copenhagen. Now, they did it for us for more than 10 years. So from 1998 through 2008, every cabinet that came out here was actually made there and shipped in. Now, they got to point themselves when they weren't necessarily doing so well. We bought the machinery and bought it in-house. So everything from 2008 onwards has come out of the UK. The three smaller machines are still in operation now and they produce 805 through to 803. This one had to be put in in 2015 because we need more power to make the larger cabinets, the 802 and the now 801. The amount of time it will be in there varies with the thickness of the cabinet and therefore the numbers of layers of wood and therefore the numbers of layers of glue. The heat is on those plates over there, you can see the number. The metal is essentially, you can think about it, like a large flat iron. So we're creating heat zones. There's heat to the bottom, at the sides and at the top. If you had a smaller cabinet with 12 layers of wood, it would be somewhere between 16 and 18 minutes. Here, you would call it 25 minutes, because there's more layers of wood. Also, the amount of power required, this one, is pressing at 80 tons vertical and 60 tons horizontal, which is pretty substantial. So the idea behind this is we can simultaneously make every stereo player model that we want without having to change the tooling. The tooling being the bit that we're pressing onto, the shape that we're pressing onto. The only time we have to stop and change the tool is if we want to make the center channel. But truthfully, the center channels are made in relatively smaller quantities, so that's not a problem. We're going to batch build those over a couple of weeks and then we go back to making the 85s and the 84s again. Now the reason for the humidified environment and the humidity dispensers, which are those big drums up there, is we don't want the guys carrying the wood around the back it won't stand right next door to the wood forming presses for the sake of efficiency. But at the same time, of course, these things are throwing a lot of heat on, which naturally and inherently dries the wood. So making sure that the environment stays with the right moisture, make sure that we're not drying it out so that when it goes in there, it cracks. You'll also have noticed when he put the thing in, he centered it very much by eye, right? It wasn't hanging around. Nobody wants to be hanging around under 135 degrees Celsius. So what we do is allow the tolerance in the wood, the excess of the wood, to give us enough like float in the process so that they can center it up by eye and get out again, which is obviously much healthier for them. There will be, when that emerges, a significant amount of excess which we machine away, and at that point we go from by eye to some millimetre there with a precision. The excess wood, of course, is recycled, so it's not wasted, but nonetheless it's a more safe and efficient way of working. Okay? If you look at the top of one of those platforms as it just comes out of the press, you can see at the moment there looks like there's a degree of separation around the wood. Now, fairly obviously, that's because we've actually applied the majority of pressure just inside of those edges. If you think about a sheet of A4 paper, you put it on your desk and you put your hand in the middle and press down, well very naturally the ends would slightly feather up if you like. That's all that's happened here. You don't have to go down very far in the machining to suddenly get to a point where there are no gaps, no air points, anything like that. If you look behind you, just here, you can very much see a before and after. So that's a cabinet wrap before it's machined away, and out to your left hand side is one post. Yeah? So the top of the cabinet is lining up to a metal edge. So if it's out, the metal will give us that skew straight away. There's no, if you like, give or bend in metal. You can't push it back into shape. So you have to get this precise. To that end, the bot has a chamber to the left hand side, which is a rotating drum, which contains different blades of different types for the task. We're also constantly monitoring the blade sharpness to make sure that when we cut, we cut with the appropriate levels of accuracy. It depends on the tool, but we get as an average somewhere between 140 and 150 cuts before we have to take the tool out and change it. In terms of the accuracy of what the job's being done, it's set, as you can see, onto a saddle, if you like, which positions it correctly. All the same, when it comes out, the guys will take each and every single one and they'll measure it to the drawing. And they'll do that in the traditional way, with a vernier. Because at this point in time, this is just wood. 
So if there's an issue, we want to capture it now. We don't want to send this all the way around the factory and discover that there's a problem. So this time taken now is a more efficient way of working later. It means we don't paint, polish, and do other things to a cabinet that might have an issue. Capture it now and fix the problem. Now, what we try to do all the way around the factory floor is as best as we can follow a process we call smooth flow. The idea behind that is you don't want to carry materials too far, not only because it's inefficient and takes time, but there's always risk of damage. Obvious example, right down the bottom end of the factory here in this section is the paint section where we're going to paint the cabinets. The largest, heaviest loudspeaker that we make is the 801. The assembly and construction area for the 801 is right next door to paint. So you minimise the amount of distance that you have moving around with an 801 cabinet. This at the other end being 805s, this is the furthest away. So the press is there, cutting there, and right there, they're going to turn that into a speaker cabinet. Let's go and look at that now. You felt from before how powerful the cabinet is just by itself. It's a fairly obvious thing, the work of holding it open so that people can do things to it safely is also fairly important. This spreader tool will reach over the top of the cabinet, and as you can see, there's a crank handle which goes to a dead stop. So they can pry it apart gently, but only to a point where, of course, it's safe to open it. They can't rip it apart, anything like that. When it's held open, then they can start inserting the glue into all the slots and also putting the front part into position. Go for it. If you want to capture it, I'll be capturing the whole thing. Obviously, once this is done, then the matrix assembly, which you can see just over there on the stick just there, is going to be put into position. Then the top and the bottom of the loudspeaker fitting into place. And then all the guys do is reverse the tool. in the racks here for a further two hours. At that point it's done. And we can't take it apart now even if we wanted to. So again, that point earlier on about taking the time to make sure we've got things right is really important. Now if you imagine at the moment this is just wood, right? So if we don't essentially provide a stop, a limit point, the wood would continue to bend up under pressure at the back. Now clearly we don't want that because at the very back, we're gonna put a much more attractive metal component on later on which houses the crossover of the loudspeaker. So this steel setting jig sits in like that, and as you can see, it's got a lift edge, and that lip provides a limit point that you can't compress beyond. So even though you're pushing really hard, the wood won't bend up. What, the reason for doing that is later on, we want the customer to be able to go to the back of the loudspeaker to that more attractive metal component and run their finger down the edge between the wood and the metal and feel a nice smooth edge, nothing subplush, nothing proud. So, although it's ugly, it's very functional. That we're bending it to, only we make the tools, right? That should, I'm sure, explain to you why we're not changing the shape of these things every year. Because every single part, whether it's that, or the pressing tool around the other side, is unique to the form that we're currently making. And we do try our best to get at least five years out of them. In some cases, they might go a little bit longer. We don't want to be 20 years equally, because people do get bored, but there's a reason why it's not a change every two year kind of thing. All of this stuff takes not only time and cost, but the guys also have to learn it. They have to learn the process. There's always a period of time when you introduce something new, where essentially the team's ramping up to understanding how to get the most from it. And I think that's an important point to emphasize. Even though the machinery that we've got is fairly state of the art, the people are really important too. How they use it, how they make the most of it. And even in a relatively automated factory, staff retention is hugely important. So we spend a lot of time not only getting the right people, but then making sure that those people want to stay, because that way you get to the rest of the best efficiencies, essentially. See that green table? 
it's a vacuum bench. So it takes the flat sheet that we discussed from before and then it sucks it down and holds it in position. You can see the template shapes that it's gonna cut from. So this is a very simple two axis saw. Those ones over there are five axis. They can spin, they can do all sorts of other stuff. This one just works forward and back, left and right. That's all it does. So it takes this, and it machines it to create that, or whichever size of model we're working on. And then the guys build them, put them together as kits. So the one that you just saw going into that loudspeaker, he would have come here, picked that up as his kit, taken it back over there and assembled it when he needs it. This is an 801 being made right now if you want to capture it. Everything's going to come in here at least one time. How many times it will be in here subsequently depends on the nature of the finish. A single walnut cabinet just needs one sand, one sand only. Fairly straightforward. From there it can go back, it can get hit with two coats of lacquer and it's done. So the walnut veneer cabinets are fairly quick. A painted or high gloss cabinet will be in here at least twice. It will be painted, uh, sanded first to get it smooth. Then it will receive its five coats of base. Now the base that we put on, or base paint that we put on, is of a thicker composition, which gives us the necessary depth and toughness. When it dries, it dries with a somewhat imperfect finish, which looks a little bit like the surface of an orange peel. And we can't have that. So we'll come back in here for a second sanding process, and that will smooth them off. That smoothing surface finish gets them to a position where they can have a different type of top coat paint applied, which is thinner and that top coat paint is what gives us that smooth finish that will then dry matte after a period of time when it's ready to be polished we can then machine polish it so if you've got any form of gloss which now means the midnight blue metallic and the black gloss there's two sanding processes and a machine polishing process if you've got a walnut cabinet or a rose nut cabinet it's sand one time much quicker Somewhere in between are our white cabinets. The reason they're in between is the white is a satin, so it doesn't have that machine polishing. And by far the longest and most complicated of the lot is this one, because it has a combination of different sanding processes and also because it has to be absolutely perfect because we're going to apply a lot of gloss lacquer to it. So the sand coats of gloss lacquer that go onto it give it that depth and that luster. But at the same time, that means if there's any surface imperfection, that's going to be amplified immediately because of all the lacquer that's on top of it. So they do an extraordinary amount of work to get these perfect, as you can see, to try and get them just right before they come out. Now, if you've sanded a wooden floor before, you'll know it's an absolutely horrendous process, and that base is a very familiar one, and you'll never do it again. It's horrible. But prior to 2015, all of our sanding work was exclusively by hand. As a result, even with the skill and the expertise of these guys, you're going to get to a point, four or five hours in, particularly on a Friday afternoon, where perhaps you aren't necessarily pressing just as smoothly and as perfectly as you would do at the start of the working week. So we invested in the three sanding robots that you can see behind you. If we move around this one, the middle one is the middle one ready to go? The sanding robot is behind there. This will spin 360 for my own shot. Yeah, yeah. Okay, John. So it works on it works on task. So they essentially have to be like recipe cards. You can see them over there. The recipe card will allow them to choose the appropriate sandpaper grip for the job because you'd use for example a more aggressive type of sandpaper grip if you were taking a finish off than if you were working on a wood veneer. It also can calculate the dimensions of what it's working to so you tell it I'm working on an 801 as opposed to an 805 and it understands. But it's also got a sensor assembly in its head 
And what it's doing is constantly monitoring the amount of pressure that it's putting down onto the surface that's pushing up against it. The reason that's relevant, of course, is if you think about a loudspeaker, it's got holes in lots of different places. What we don't want is the robot to push hard on a flat surface and then get to a point where there's an aperture for a drive unit and suddenly dip in. If it dipped in, it would essentially round off that nice sharp edge that we want. Clearly, we're not after that. So the sensor gives it the ability to sound right on the edge, allows the guys to focus much more on the detail elements. So the really substantial sections that otherwise previously you'd have been working at for hours, depends on the model. Time is that saying about a 60, 70 minute cycle? Selected, okay. Uh, 25, minutes, 25. There we go. Depending on the model, it can be up to 70 minutes. In this particular case, I think it's doing top, so it's going to be shorter. But it will vary the program from somewhere between 20 and 75. When it emerges, it's good to go, and they can start working on it from a detailed point of view, as you can see. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of the Absolute Sound. We have a new product, it's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. All of our standard finishes. We paint by batch, so we don't go one white, one black, one blue, etc. We also work by model, so we don't jump between an 8 to 5 and an 8 to 2 and an 8 to 1. So what we're going through here with is a lot of 8 to 5s, okay? This is a stoving oven. It's actually baking the paint. You put your hand in the glass, you can feel it vibrating a little bit just under the energy from the oven. Now it's not baking at super high temperatures, it's quite gentle. The reason for that, of course, is if you try and cook it too quickly, the paint will dry up too fast, and again, it will crack. So it's a nice, smooth, even cook. They're in there for, depending on the spot, around 45 minutes. And the reason for it, if you like that snaky tray, is to make sure that they get evenly cooked all the way round. So the platforms gently turn them as they move around so that all sides are basted, if you like. It's like a giant rotisserie oven, when you think about it. When they emerge at this end into free air, they're being cleaned, and they're going past vacuum benches, which are sucking away any sawdust that's in the environment. And clearly, we're in an area where there's a fair amount of sawdust. We don't want to paint onto that. As they go around, the guys will clean them before they enter the chamber at the other end to be painted. Now, the paint application process itself is really fast depending on the model, anywhere from between 45 seconds and two and a half minutes. But putting it on pretty quick. It's the stoving and the cycles that take the time. Remember, a black cabinet with nine coats of paint is nine times 45 minutes. And that's in between various second sound processes, curing times and so forth. So black cabinets are quite long-winded to make. Around this way. At the end of each week, there's also a deep clean, a whole deep contamination. We normally start on Monday with lighter finishes or lacquers because they're less tolerant of paint contamination. So the cleanest it ever gets, of course, is on Sunday, that deep clean. Monday morning is typically white cabinet Monday. As you can see, pretty fast, right? We're standing there and it's whacked through one. We run it on the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I promised him. 
some coverage. Obviously a huge important part of our narrative and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it before, going back a long time. It is um, still made for us by Element 6, if you're familiar with them, part of the Ascot based De Beers group. Um, they produce um, industrial grade gypsy diamond stuff for uh, drilling and that kind of thing and also synthetically grown diamond, which this is. So it's, it's incredibly light, don't worry it won't break, but you're going to sense it from that. There's nothing much to it. If you tap it, I will warn you now, the likelihood is it will break because it's 40 micron and it weighs 88 milligrams. There's nothing much to it at all. So, obviously you know the story, right? But the rationale behind doing it is about trying to push away the moment the first breakup as far as we possibly can. You all understand, it's great talking to you guys because we have to go into the minutiae, but um, what we came to the conclusion is more than 20 years ago now was that if you try to get to a point where you exceeded the border limit, if you say that's 20, obviously the older we become it tends to drop off, but if you say it's 20 kilohertz, uh, then in theory what you get is more benign behaviour within the audible range. So uh, initially we were using aluminium, which was getting us to around 30 kilohertz, that was the first generation 800 series. Um, the theory was if we try to use more stiff materials, what happens? Could we get to a point where we drop back to results? So different types of material were evaluated, including beryllium, which of course I'm sure you know lots of other companies use as well. Uh, we came to the conclusion that doing this was probably the best from our perspective. So, um, but the logic and the premise is literally the same as the aluminium dome and of course the carbon dome which we use in the 700 series. Essentially by using a light, highly stiff material, we get a dome that ideally stays in shape rather than bending and flexing and distorting and it pushes away the first breakup point to an incredibly high threshold. This is getting to around 70 kilohertz, 72 to be precise, and that means, in theory, at least very benign behavior within the audible range, which is the reason why we do it. So they come to us in these rather handy uh, pouches of the field. It's kind of got a soft gel on it. And what that's doing is essentially making sure that the dome doesn't shift around inside the case. So they sh RIP, obviously, but we don't want to get involved in manufacture because it's involving superheated temperatures and high pressures, so it's dumped by E6. It comes to us in these trays, like that. You can see them over there, stacks and stacks and stacks of them. And then the guys will go through the whole process, fitting coil, fitting surround, getting it into the diaphragm mounting plate, which makes it an awful lot less scary to handle because suddenly it's something to actually get hold of. Um, and then it goes onto the magnet and motor system. And then at the end round here, it will get tested in that consumer, that cabinet that you can see there, that's the end of line test. Um, to make sure that tests and measures that we want to do. Um, and then from there, it's going downstairs onto the production line. So, let's put that one back in there. The other key part of what we're doing here beyond making the dome onto its assembly, or putting the dome onto its assembly, pardon me. Oh, I forgot that one. Sugar. There we go. Is this, this is the solid body tweeter assembly. You've seen those before, right? Um, we don't, again, get involved in milling, machining, metal on the site here. You don't want to do that, so it comes to us from the supplier. But this young man over here organised getting one of the billets from our supplier just so we could get a sense of what it originally comes from. So this is machined from that as a solid. So it's a single piece. Obviously, again, all the byproducts taken away, recycled and reused to make more of these billets. So the solid body assembly, um, again, has been around for a period. Some of you will remember looking at it in the D3 era. Of course, one of the big stories in the D4 was it's longer. If you remember in the older generation, it was more around that kind of length. Now, longer tube lengths in general terms tend to be more desirable. You guys all understand the reason why we use those tube lengths, right? Because what we're doing is trying to take the back of the cabinet away from the back of the diaphragm. And essentially, it's the same premise as we used with the Nautilus more than 20 years ago. So the idea is, if the sorry, if the, di the diaphragm's doing that, it's generating pressure inside the enclosure. The more it moves, the more pressure builds up inside the enclosure to a point where perhaps that pressure is actually exerting a back pressure against the dome. Rather like if you're trying to pump up a football with a hand pump and you get to a point where you can't get any more air into it, it starts to starts to push back against you. So it's the same thing. So the idea behind tube loading is you take the back of the diaphragm cabinet and you move it away from the back of the diaphragm and then you allow the energy to dissipate down a damp tube. So if you look down this one, you'll see this hollow thing all the way through, yeah? So the dome is exiting into that, and then this is filled with an insert 
which has wadding and essentially allows that energy to dissipate along the length of the tube. Nautilus set the template for that, like I say, a long time ago. The larger the driving it becomes in the Nautilus, the longer the tube length, which is why the largest one of the lot is swirled up, because if it was straight as a tube, it would be three metres plus. So that's the reason for that design. Anyway, back on 800s, the reason we went for the longer tube length is for all those good things. We couldn't do it before, because the longer the tube length becomes, the heavier this becomes. And this, of course, is also isolated or decoupled from the head assembly that sits below it. So in the last generation, we experimented with that, and we found that because of its increased weight, it wasn't decoupling properly. So the breakthrough that enabled this in D4 was an improved decoupling system, the two-point decoupling system. You can see there are two slots here at the bottom, and it now sits on those two points. You'll remember from the older ones, the ones you've still got, actually, you, you lift up the back, it's only located on one, and the rest of it's just a kind of location point. This new two-point decoupling allows us to essentially make a heavier tube and still decouple it essentially which means in turn we can make it longer so this is approaching two kilos whereas the one in d3 was just under one kilo so that was the sort of rationale so this is where we wanted to be all along but we couldn't get there before summary what that means of course in the essence is that we now get a really nice open sound from the high frequencies again if you've experienced and listened to d3 relative to d4 I think most people who've heard the D4 would agree they sound smoother at the top and freer and more open. I know you've heard that experience yourself. This is an enabler. This is part of the reason why that's happened. So, various versions here, over there, packed in box. Let's place the equipment, take the labels on right now to prove that they're ready to go. And at that point, they'll go downstairs onto the line ready for the guys to start building. Okay? Everything is hand soldered. It's not to say that one process is better than the other, it's just this is totally fine for our workload. So um, what we're doing here is soldering by hand on the layout. We've got those built to reference boards, so they'll build an individual board like that. They'll test and measure the individual board, and then they'll put the whole thing onto the assembly that goes with it. Does that help, Alan? Yep. Put it in the correct orientation. See? Perfect. Uh, and obviously once in place is a complete assembly then they'll test that as well. The reason of course that process is relevant is clearly that's a very very simple crossover, that's an 805, just first order, there's only four components in it, you know, one, two, three, four, pretty simple. By the time you get to an 801 there's quite a few more bits, so the process requires all the extra validation. Um, all of these are reference boards, so if you look they've all got Steve Pierce's squiggle there to show they've been signed off and when they've been signed off and the date. 2021 in this particular case. So these are used essentially to test and verify the calibration data, which is why they live here. So the process is the start of a build, you take these off, you'll measure this. This should measure to the stored calibration data because in theory, this is what you're measuring. Therefore, subsequently, each one that you're making should measure back to this. You can be sure what you're doing. Um, you'll also notice the purpose of our day that there are different boards for signatures. Um, I can highlight these again when we go around to the Vista Centre later on, but if you look, the yellow elements that you see here, yep. these are the bypass capacitors. And if you want to look back again at a regular model, but again, I can show you this later on the VC, you'll see that it's a significantly different design in that regard. The main values, the main values are the same, the bypass capacitors are the upgraded element, okay? but again, distinct from the stock model. So, basket or chassis we buy in. Again, like the tweeter body up there, we don't want to get involved in machining out metal, so it comes to us from a supplier. But again, it's our design, it's an aluminium construction. End cap, as you can see, that particular one's fully loaded, so if you take it, pop that on. In this particular case, it's a base cone, coil a spider arm, that on there, that on there, and you've just made it. It's easy. Um, Magnets, when you get to an 800 series level, you're in the world of neodymium, really high performance magnets. Obviously, hugely powerful. Have you ever handled one of these things? <laughs> so, watch. It will just fly out of your hands. You try to take it off. Then, when you put it back, just please make sure your fingers are there, not there, because I don't need to get hurt, all right? 
pretty powerful, yeah. right? Now think about how powerful it is when it gets to that size. <laughs> um, so these aren't magnetized. We magnetize them over there. Because as you can imagine, unpacking a box full of these when they're magnetized will be a barrel of us. <laughs> um, so we're magnetizing them ourselves, which means we can test and verify that they are to the correct spec, and then they go forward into the line. So on the line over here, you can see the black chassis. The black chassis is an 805 signature. You can see the standard chassis here, that's for a regular 805. What we do when we've got two drive unit designs of the same external dimension is to help the guys who are working on the final product assembly lines, we make different versions in different colours to help them ID them. Otherwise, it's very difficult to tell. If you looked at it externally, you wouldn't be able to understand that the HFI has a superior upgraded magnet and motor system. So the black one is used as a way of, if you like, differentiating. The same applies to an 801, Jace. So an 801 mid is black and an 802 mid is silver. And again, that's part highlighting that it's got the double silver motor as opposed to the double copper. And the same for the base for the 10 inch. So this is a regular standard 801 10 inch. A black chassis is a signature. It just helps the guys understand what's going on. So again, units go in, test and verify, just the same process as you saw upstairs. And then they're packed in box and ready to go onto the production line. This part of the process only applies to anything gloss. So if you were working on a satin cabinet or a wooden cabinet, it wouldn't come here. However, if you're talking about the new signature and the California Burl finish, the Midnight Blue, or of course the gloss black, it's gonna come here. The bot that you can see over there at the end is the same type as the sanding box that you saw earlier. The difference, of course, is what it's doing is polishing rather than sanding the surface. It's using high quality automotive detailing paint, and it's gonna take this, polished part of paint, and it's gonna take this sheen that you can see here and turn it to this. Remember I spoke from before, it dries matte. When you polish it up, you bring it back. So what we get to is the luster that you can see on the cabinets here. Okay, how was your break? That looked very nice. How are you? How was your holiday break? No. Cycle time again around the 17 minute mark, depends with the finish. And then from there, it's straight on to our final product. <laughs> They'll take the line reference for a signature out, run it through the chamber, measure it, it should line up. So anything smaller that's painted by hand as opposed to painted by the robot is prepared here. So if you look behind you guys, you can see a box that's over in the corner of raw metal heads. Again, they come to us from a supplier, in this case inside the UK, because it's a very substantial metal component. We don't want to be shipping that too far. It's cast rather than milled from solid. Obviously they get quite big turbine heads, so you don't want to take a single billet and machine that away. Uh, you've got 18 kilograms of aluminium left over. They will come in here and they will be surface prepared. So we'll sand them down and we'll get them smooth and then we'll get them ready to receive paint. Everything's done by hand, including, for example, the pair that's just around the corner. Yeah. Are we allowed to not for me? As you can see, pretty much hazmat suits because you don't want to be sitting here kind of inhaling this stuff for too long, hence the fact we won't be here too long ourselves. Uh, it's basically done the same way as ever. This stuff called chop stand mat is based on glass fiber, the fiber glass, kind of make boats. In the old days, there was a company called Race Prep that used to make it for us. Race Prep used to make Formula 4 racing cars. Um, the reason we went to them at the time, which is in the early 1990s, is because again, we were making the mighty wooden joint cabinets. We had no idea how to make something curve like this. They were obviously experts in making curved shapes. So it's two moulds. The moulds themselves are built from the same material, plus the front section. Uh, these two sections clamshell in half. So what they'll do at the start of the week is they'll be building up each individual half section. 
and at the same time making the front section, the tailpipes and so forth. To give you a sense of what it's like, you can see on the inside face, yes, yeah. and relative thickness, about six mil from memory. Um, that's the gel coat on the outside. The gel coat is the first part that goes on obviously inside the mold. That's what creates the smooth surface onto which we can paint and polish. So the manufacturing process has not changed in 30 years. Um, the reason why we still do it is because people still want it. I mean, again, you guys all know, but just to be hyper clear for those that have never been here before, it's not the best loudspeaker that we make. It's 30 years old for heaven's sake. It's, um, it's a classic now, it's the best way to think about it. So in the same way as if you want and you ask nicely, Aston Martin will make you a James Bond DB5, they call it a continuation edition. This is one of those, right? So it's two order, it's, it's phenomenally expensive, um, but it's very lovely and it takes a long time. Making this to this point, bear in mind it's Thursday, that have started on Monday and they'll pull it out of the mold tomorrow, they call it the birthday. Uh, and on Friday, there it is, it's ready to go and it can move forward. So it's one cabinet or shell per week. 